So, this is the day that I give you the backstory on Voices of Afrolatia and how it happened. So, we go back to 2020. You know, um, more people were starting to want to hear from directly impacted voices. More people were starting to be interested in uh, racial equity, diversity, equity, inclusion. So your boy was at the table, been at the table as it relates to substance use disorder. And um, and so one thing that I had noticed was the lack of uh, diversity within the mental health workforce. And um, so, I, you know, I had my eyes open, my ears open, trying to figure out ways to improve that. Um, and, and then I, I seen an article by Victor Armstrong, Salute Victor Armstrong. He had, had something in an article talking about, you know, ending the stigma in the black community. And he, and he mentioned diversifying the mental health workforce as a strategy and and a part of that strategy he mentioned uh was peer support specialists and leveraging lived experience which was powerful you know got me super duper inspired when i seen it i was so inspired because this brother is like was at the time was the director of the department of health and human services like way up you know what i'm saying and so when i seen that you know i started thinking my wheels are already turning because like i say I'm a person in long-term recovery. I have lived experience as a service provider and a service recipient. You know, been to treatment, been to prison, all the things, man. And and so I was passionate about diversifying it because when I was in treatment, there wasn't that many people of color there. And when I was working in the field at like Neil Dobbins Center and other places, it wasn't many people of color that were like the addiction professionals. And so I was I was interested in like, how can I contribute to diversifying the mental health workforce and slay this stigma because what i do know is black people get high and black people have mental health challenges they might not go to treatment but they need treatment and they need help and we got to address that if we're to improve the outcomes you did and so what ended up happening was i reached out to susan aka mama bear from uh next step recovery shout out to next step recovery been around doing the work for a long time and susan stater is amazing she's got a lot of respect you feel me um, reached out to her and I say, hey, do you got some connections with the board? Because in my mind, I was like, you know what? I want to get some data. I want to see how many addiction professionals, when we start talking about the mental health workforce, I want to see like how many addiction professionals are actually, you know, black, black and brown. How many people of color are actually doing that, especially in Western North Carolina? So I reached out to Susan. She connected me with a guy named Barton Colbreth from at the time it was called the North Carolina Substance Abuse Professional Practice Board. Nowadays, it's called the North Carolina Addiction Specialist Practice Board. And I reached out to him and I say, hey, um, I need some data. I need some help. I'm working on something, man, as it relates to racial equity. Because like I say, a lot of people were starting to prioritize racial equity and, and stuff like that. So this is a good opportunity for me to, to leverage the, the, the current environment to get the resources that was needed. And so I reached out to him. He provided data surrounding how many people of color had the credential for CSAC. Well, formerly known as CSAC, it's now called CADC or CADAC. Some people pronounce it that way, but it's Certified Alcohol and Drug Counselor. And then you have LCAS. L, uh, LCAS stands for Licensed Clinical Addiction Specialist. And I'm breaking these down because I hate when people be using all them acronyms and I don't be knowing what they be talking about. So I want to make sure I practice what I preach. Um, but you got LCAS, you got uh, 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 CCS, which stands for Certified Clinical Supervisor. And um and also they had a credential for criminal justice. I forgot exactly what it was called, like CJDP or something. It was like criminal justice related to like alcohol and, and drug uh, addiction specialists. And so when he provided the data, I was disgusted, had nausea. Uh, it was kind of what I expected. And and he and he he himself seen that it was you know it was an issue because it we really didn't have that much diversity when you looked at those credentials. And at that time, I came up with an idea called the Clinician of Color Movement. I had already been using the lingo clinician of color movement um, and I was trying to create something at the time, but like people just wasn't focusing as much on racial equity. 2020 is when a lot of that started happening. So anyway, once I got that data, I reached out to my comrade at Dogwood Health Trust. Shout out to Dr. Bragg. So I reached out to Dogwood Health Trust, me and Dr. Bragg at the time. I want to say we went and got coffee at this place called Waterbird. It was a coffee shop. Uh, it didn't make it. That coffee shop shut down, but it was on Charlotte Street called the Waterbird. 
and we sat down and I and I pitched it to her and I had a good relationship already with Dogwood because I almost was about to work for Dogwood. It's on like my third interview, but I didn't end up getting getting the uh getting a job because they shifted gears with the focus to focus more on COVID response. Cause when the pandemic hit, you know, Dogwood stepped up to the plate in a major way with getting that education and materials, PPE and all the stuff out there to the people, man. And so anyway, I had that relationship with Dogwood and had been at some tables. And so when I had leaned into the conversation with Dr. Bragg, pitching my idea to her, she loved it. She was like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. And I asked her for some guidance, like on what should I do next? Because for me, I knew I wanted to diversify and get more people to get the credentials. Like like CSAC or CADC, you know, being more uh, alcohol and drug counselors. And I also wanted more people to, you know, if it was other people that had like a, a master's degree that wanted to become LCASs and stuff, wanted to address access because access also was a challenge, right? And addressing inequities, you have to look at addressing access. And so when I was talking to her, uh, she kind of co-created it with me. She was like, well, you should consider having a, a certified clinical supervisor. You know what I'm saying? Because you would need that too. And, and you know, she was like a thought partner. And a clinician of color movement was created. You know what I'm saying? And shout out to Dogwood Health Trust. They funded it. And shout out to Yemoja because I had to find a nonprofit to receive it because I didn't have a nonprofit at the time. I didn't have a nonprofit partner at the time. And so I went to Michael Hayes at Yemoja and I said, hey, bro, would you be willing to house this? Because I need somewhere for this money to go to from Dogwood. And so the clinician of color movement was created. So I was on a hunt to look for a CCS. So I went hollered at Viren Eliza. Viren is amazing. She's the clinical director at Oasis. I believe she's still doing that, but she's got a lot of experience, a lot of respect in the recovery community, black, female. Um, reached out to her and asked her, would she be the certified clinical supervisor? Because we had to have a certified clinical supervisor to oversee the whole project. And so when I met with her, she was like, yeah, it would be nice. You know, she became a thought partner as well. She was be nice if you if you also had like a, a, a LCAS, on 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 staff too because we could also have be raising up some more clinical supervisor interns i was like oh my gosh that's dope great idea and that's why it's important to partner with purpose have thought partners because it, it, this ain't a one-man show you got to have people contributing so i say bet bet so we we continue to build and she recruit i want to say heather and ashley talbert they own uh from the ashes amazing uh twins actually they're l casters and c uh, certified uh they're, they're clinical supervisor interns and so what we ended up doing was creating the clinician of color movement we got funding from dogwood health trust so nobody had to pay for supervision and we paid the certified clinical supervisor for her time we paid the clinical supervisor interns for their time supervising the uh the supervision groups and they were diversified groups so this meant that these these addiction professionals that needed clinical supervision, they were getting to be in spaces that was all people of color. In their supervision groups are all people of color. Imagine that. And your clinical supervisor was a person of color. Imagine that. Like people coming from working in spaces where they may have been the only black person in the meeting, the only black person on staff, the only black person in the supervision group to being in a in a supervision group full of people of color. And so that's how the clinician of color movement was created. Shout out to Tiffany, uh, Tiffany and Nacho. You know what I'm saying? She was the first LCAS that we brought on board. You know what I'm saying? And 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 as a thought partner. And like I say, and she uh ended up being one of the people to provide the super the uh the group supervision. And nobody had to pay. Nobody had to pay for their clinical supervision, whether it was for their LCAS credential, for their clinical supervisor intern credential, or for their uh, certified alcohol and drug counsel credential. That's what addressing inequities look like. That's what a uh, 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 leading with equity in mind looks like. Addressing access. And so why the Clinician of Color movement was created? Now, I'm getting somewhere. I'm talking about how Voices of Afrolatia was formed. While Clinician of Color movement was was rocking and rolling your boy was on linkedin and you better tighten up on your linkedin and y'all got no linkedin you better tighten up on it linkedin is a, is a is a valuable tool for for networking and connecting with other folks i'm telling you that's about that life so i'm on linkedin and i'm doing little videos and stuff like that now this is where victor armstrong come in and it was powerful how him and dr laws end up coming in so um i had already been pitching ideas to folks and sending emails because that's what i do i don't mind being a squeaky wheel i'm a whole lot of advocate for people and a voice for people that don't know how to use their voice yet so I'm doing this video and I'm, I'm recruiting people of color to join the clinician of color movement. And I'm doing this video and I'm talking about like they don't have to pay for supervision and they'll come into a into a diverse group. And the next thing you know, you know, Victor and Dr. Laws then was like, who is this brother? You know, what I'm saying they reach out like, hey, we'd like to meet with you. And so when I met with them and I told them about what was going on, they loved it. They loved it. 
And during that time, I was like, man, what's actually going on in Western North Carolina? Where are the black leaders at? What are the black leaders up to in the, the mental health space, in the, in the health and human services space? And I say, uh, we up here. We just spread out. We don't get to be at all tables because a lot of, I mean, you, it's Western North Carolina. You still got the systemic racism. And a lot of times they keep some of us from being at the table. You know what I'm saying? That's the reality of it. And they was like, can you put together like a little listening session? We want to meet some folks up there. I was like, uh, yeah. So the conversation started for me recruiting people for the clinician of color movement to them saying, hey, we want to learn what's going on in Western North Carolina <clears throat> and hear from more, uh, you know, leaders of color. And so they asked if I could do a listening session. I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> Work, holy ghost. So anyway, I reach out to Dogwood and I say, listen, y'all, y'all ain't gonna believe what just happened. You know, I heard from the state level folks. And they all popular, all like the high, the high altitude leaders. They know each other. And so when I mentioned those names, it's like, yeah, that's amazing. Oh my God, it's happening. You know, that was excited for me. Dogwood was, was excited for me. That was excited for the region. So I started putting together this listening session. And I reached out to uh, you know, Dogwood, and they was like, Well, you know, we can we can provide some resources for the listening session so you can put something together nice. And so um, there's like what nonprofit you want to use. And so I reached out to Suzanne Mazur Porter at the United Way of Rutherford County. Uh, Suzanne Missoula Porter has proven to be a leader uh, uh, in a rural area that is trusted, a leader in a rural area that's willing to innovate, a leader that ain't a scared, that ain't scared, who has lived experience as a you know as a parent. You know what I'm saying? Um, I hate that uh, you know not putting our business out there because we did a uh, we co-facilitated a webinar for the National Association of Community Health Workers, and she shared some of her story. But you know, I reached out to her and I was like, hey. Uh, this is what the state level folks are wanting to do. And she heard it. She was so impressed and so excited for me because she knew me as an activist and an advocate. And she was just so happy to see this level of work starting to come. And so she was like, I'll support it in any way possible. Shout out to those allies who put in there, putting, putting, you know, walking their talk. And so I asked her if they could house, you know, uh, the funding for this listening session because I needed a couple thousand dollars to put some stuff together, you know, to cover housing. Well, actually, they had state dollars. They didn't have to pay for housing, but I wanted to cover like a meal and I wanted to cover like food for the listening session and, and gas and travel for those different rural leaders. And, 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 and so Suzanne said, like, yeah, she even helped me put together the budget. That's what allies do. You feel me? Shout out to the real allies out there. So I reached out to leaders from Transylvania County, uh, uh, Rutherford County, Polk County, Murphy, uh, not Murphy, but uh, uh, McDowell County, Marion area. And I'm talking about I diversified this listening session, y'all. You know what I'm saying? I ain't trying to brag, but I, I will boast in the Lord because the Lord is what is who gave me the gifting of connections, right? As an evangelist. But I had preach, I had a preacher there. I had a, a what they call a, a qualified professional, a, 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 a licensed mental health professional. I had a, a, a couple of L casters there. Sharon from uh, AB. Hold on. I had Sharon. It was a black counselor from AB Tech and a, a leader in the faith community. I had uh, Lexi Wilkins there who was a heavy hitter and like post overdose response team and like one of the uh, peer support pioneers of this area um, with uh, uh, like with a wealth of knowledge. I had uh, 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 Tor White was there because uh, I had met her in a recovery coach class and just seen her passion for mental health. So I had her come there representing Buncombe. Uh, Lexi was kind of representing Henderson. Uh, I had Sharon there representing Buncombe. I had Chris Forney there uh, as mental, you know, mental health uh, 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 experience and um, peer support. And from McDowell County, I had uh, uh, Reverend Lipsy there from Rutherford County, black preacher, boots on the ground. Has always been a trusted go-to to get make things happen. I had uh, um, a young lady named Leslie that was from Jackson County, uh, black female from out that way. You know, peer support specialist, boots on the ground. Um, I had uh, who else did I have there? I said Lipsy. I had Lexi Tor. I had Jamil. Oh my gosh, Jamia Davis from Transylvania County. Um, there, she's a freaking licensed uh, LPC and LCSW. All the things. I'm trying to think. Who am I missing? I'm, I'm pretty sure I covered everybody. And if I did, leave somebody out. Y'all forgive me because I'm, I'm. I gotta get this video done because I got a lunch meet starting at at twelve. But anyway, so I had diversity. So Dr. Laws and Victor Armstrong come up here. I introduced them to some other leaders in Marion, like Donna Good. Shout out to Donna Good. Um, and so they come up here, they, we have this listening session and people are just talking about the gaps in services and their experiences being, you know, working in the field and, and stuff like that. They share their, some share their lived experience and man, they were so impressed that they turned around and, and, and they funded, um, uh, some, they, they put more funds in the area to do something called project urgent need. I'm going to do an additional video on project urgent need to give you all the details about what we were able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. But these are all the deliverables. These are the return on investments that came from the clinician of color movement. And so like 
whenever we got the funds to do that work with Project Urgent Need, you know what I'm saying? It was a beautiful thing. I was able to, to hire some, some contracted peer supports to get with people, help them get into housing. There, there was some another team that was distributing uh, Narcan. Um, and it was crazy, man. We helped a lot of people. We partnered real strong with the Oxford House to get people into, uh, into safe housing that were coming out of treatment and stuff. Um, and this was, it was called Project Urgent Need. And those were state dollars that came through as well. And shout out to the United Way of Rutherford County, man. I'm so grateful, forever grateful for Suzanne was a reporter for a willing to partner. That's my wonder twin. And, and, and it's a beautiful thing that she leaned in and was willing to take this level of work on because I know their business office was hit whenever we came in with all of these, these, uh, invoices and stuff like that, man. But we was able to provide opportunities for contractors as well you know what i'm saying like contractors are able to come on make some extra money for their families and provide resources in places that wasn't getting them and so anyway after project urgent need went down they were so impressed we we got um a whole nother initiative which is voice uh, voices of afrolatia went to the next level and i called it voices of afrolatia because it started as a listening session that's why i called it voices of afrolatia and it ended up being a whole live initiative so some people ask me if voices of afrolatia is an entity it's not an entity it is housed at the united way of rutherford county because like i say that is a trusted nonprofit that is doing great work in rutherford county and it is led by an amazing leader who gets it especially from a racial equity point uh racial equity lens um, the, the new work that took on from Voices of Afrolatia, you know, um, some of the details we have a VOA reentry team and I am the, v the VOA reentry team lead and I got Gene and Lindsay working with me, they're community health workers. With Voices of Afrolatia, we're looking at addressing the mental health stigma in the communities of color of Western North Carolina and with doing that, of course, we are addressing those credentials that can be the bridges leveraging their lived experience and those credentials are community health worker and peer support and a part of my role with Voices of Afrolatia is recruiting people to take the peer support training and a community health worker training and making sure that they got stipends if they were unemployed or if they had to take off work to take those trainings um and i also lead the reentry team and with that i'm doing a lot of education building capacity about community health worker because that is the credential for us people of color when you start looking at health equity including you know mental health and substance use right and um, also a lot of meetings that I do with other stakeholders across the region who are wanting to do more with reentry, helping them build, providing frameworks for them and best practices for them, connecting them to resources. That's what my role is with Voices of Afrolatia. And um, and then you got like uh, uh, some other crisis services that are going down. We have love and respect. They was able to get a peer support specialist on their team that's working on engaging the communities of color with a with a strong focus on the faith community because we know that the church plays a major role in addressing anything in the black community. What well, no matter what people got to say about the church, the church plays a major role in 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 stepping up and handling business. And we have been able to partner with some churches that were willing to have and host you know like trainings in their in their facilities. We've been able to provide. You know, mental health first aid trainings free of charge, peer support specialist trainings free of charge, paying for community health worker trainings, motivational interview and trainings. And as we expand, our next step is uh, is, is taking a motivational interview into the next level and a recovery coach training to the next level. And that's one of the things I'm trying to adjust right now is just getting more people of color to become uh, recovery coaches because that's the one thing that we don't have that many of. But um, Voices of Afrolatia has taken off. We've helped a lot of people. You know, um, I will continue to do videos. The next video I might do might be more so leaning on talking about the numbers of the, the people that we've served and like the outcomes or whatever. Um, how many people serve being, you know, getting them safely housed or trainings, connected with the peer support, connected to career centers, whatever that may be. My, fo my focus has strongly been on the re returning citizens because Operation Gateway is the nonprofit that I started to serve returning citizens. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity um, to work alongside my Wonder Twin, Suzanne was reporter because she's also given me wisdom and guidance on being uh, an executive director. And with me being the Voices of Afrolatia Reentry Team Lead, I am gaining that experience leading the reentry efforts. I've already been doing the reentry work for many years, but now I'm doing it more from a leadership perspective. I'm not doing as much of the hands-on as I used to. I got a team that's doing it. Now, I still will jump in there and take somebody to the DMV. I still will jump in there and take somebody to a recovery meeting. I still will jump in there and take somebody to go get some underwear and socks and stuff like that that just came from prison and give them a $1,000 motivational speech in my Jeep Compass. Can I get an amen? Because um, I love the work. I love doing that work. It's, it don't even feel like work. I love inspiring the people on the returning citizen side because I remember what it was like for me when I was in prison and when I got out and wanted to turn my life around. See, prison did what it needed to do for me. You feel me? And so I know there's a lot of people that are getting out that's wanting to change their life. And so that's why I'm so passionate about working with people from prison. And I also know with, you know, uh, talking about equity in the substance use disorder space, a lot of black people are using, but a lot of black people aren't going to treatment. But a lot of black people are going to prison with substance use disorder, whether it's diagnosed or not. So we need
need to be readily prepared to receive them from prison with with leveraging lived experience by way of community health workers to ensure that we normalize talk about treatment we normalize talk about healing to where they feel like they can open up about their issues and they get the appropriate resources and appropriate help that they need right bridging the gaps to the to the uh, resources whether it's continuity of care for medical whether it's continuity of care for mental health whether it's whether it's uh, driver's license restoration whether it's reconnecting with their families with food resources all the things you know what i'm saying safely housed all the things you know social determinants of health for returning citizens i go on a whole tangent with a tangent with another video for that but i'm approaching 20 minutes for those of you that made it through the whole 20 minutes um thank you mm, thank you for those who have been praying for me that are in support of the work that i've been doing um you know voices of Afrolatia, like i say it started from trying to address the uh, lack of diversity in the mental health work workforce so that we could slay stigma in the communities of color because we know we need to do better in the communities of color as it relates to substance use and mental health you know and shout out to those people that have poured into my spirit as mentors shout out to michael woods uh vicky meath uh celeste collins you know people like that the executive directors that have been teaching me you know what i'm saying for real for real um shout out to uh to to, to my uh sponsor you know what i'm saying pastor vince you know um those people who was keeping me in check and even me connected with just leadership usa is lester young you know what i'm saying having a coach on that level you know, because this ain't no one-man show. You feel me? Change Agent Cooper is a guy. But it's a whole bunch of y'all change agents out there. Change Agent whoever he is. Or are. Y'all hear that grammar just now? Wow. But for real, for real, man, VOA is it's doing its thing, man. It's crazy how it started. It was all God. I got to give all praises to God because it wasn't even my plan. I was planning to do a listening session so that they could get connected to more people. And more people ended up with a lot of opportunities. You know, and one other, let me show you this. I'm mean, in conclusion. I forgot the one component of VOA because I wasn't looking to promote VOA with this. I just want to tell y'all the backstory of how it happened. But the other thing with VOA was we were able to get people access to therapy at no cost. So, but the, but the caveat is people had to be uninsured. They could not have any type of insurance to uh, to get the therapy. They couldn't have Medicaid or no insurance. So we was able to get a couple of, I think it was like three people in therapy. And we helped a lot of people with driver's license restoration. It's crazy what VOA was able to do. And I'm going to do a whole nother video about VOA deliverables. So, so anyway, thank you for your time. You know what I'm saying? And thank you for your prayers. I'm about to go in here to this lunch meeting. You dig what I'm saying at Hickory Tavern with my with the reentry team. And we finna talk about, you know, partner uh, continuing the partnerships. We finna talk about those people that's about to get out soon. And we finna talk about improving the relationship with FQHCs. My name is Change Agent Cooper. I'm not the answer, but I'm for damn sure the alternative.